the grand scheme of the world is um, number of people, population, uh, labor force, times hours worked, times productivity. And uh, what you've seen happening over the last, I don't know, 10 years is a declining growth rate in the labor force, driven by demographics. I mean, everybody acts rationally from their own point of view. And it's management's job, the Fed's job, government's job to go and create the carrots so people act uh, in the way that's best for public policy. Uh, so you can lay a good portion of, of this problem uh, at the Fed. At the time, we had a big skew in puts versus calls going out 10 years, and you could put together a rather fancy trade where you could um, uh, buy the call, sell the put for zero cost and have incredible exposure. The, the exact ticket that we, we looked at back then was um, buying the 1800 call and selling the 850 put on the S&P. Market then was about 14, 1450 for 10 years, zero cost. So I'm here in Las Vegas at the EQ Derivatives Conference, again, sitting down with Harley Bassman, one of my favorite people. Uh, Harley, we are going to talk, revisiting a little bit of last year, talk about some of your recent ideas that you've put forward. You have uh, taken a bit of a retirement, but are continuing to trade on your personal account. Is that right? A hedge fund of one. A hedge fund of one. Yeah. Um, and that is actually a fascinating situation, right? Because for the first time, you're not worried about what anyone else is doing, or one of the first times you're not worried about what anyone else is doing. And the character of your trades, I have seen them stretch in duration. So I have a couple of them on, um, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit about them. But welcome, and uh, let's get started. Thank you. You sent us a slide package, and we're going to show a couple of these slides as we go through this, but one in particular I want to focus on is the dynamics of the relationship between equities and interest rates, 10-year bonds in particular. When we look at this, we see that the correlation between the two has changed. And so most people think about it as a discounting mechanism, but it now appears that higher interest rates are correlated with higher equity prices. Why is this? What does this mean to you? Well, I mean, since the great financial crisis, what we've seen is basically stocks and bonds move in opposite directions. Uh, they're, they're basically self-hedging, which I guess is good if you're a, uh, an asset manager. Risk parity has been a, a fabulous trade. I think that if and when you see this correlation reverse, that'll be problematic. It hasn't happened yet. It looks to be correlated or m m most linked to interest rate levels. And so I suspect that once you get rates above 3.5% of the 10-year, um, you'll probably see that uh, that correlation flip around. So people who are hedging equities with bonds, um, well, they'll be sorry because both will go down. And if you look at the last, you know, X number of years, both stocks and bonds have basically gone to their near their all-time highs. And so w when I think about this, like, why would I care, right? I build a portfolio on 50-50 equities and bonds, somewhat independent, but ultimately bonds are delivering me a fixed income component and the equities are delivering me whatever they're going to. Why does that correlation matter? What, what does that actually mean? Well, if you're in a 60-40 portfolio, all's fine. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it goes up and down and, and, and uh, you're diversified and that works. Uh, what happens uh, in, in practice is people usually lever of these trades up. So they might have, you know, if $100, they might do $130 in bonds and $70 in equities. So they have $200 uh, totally invested, but only 100 in capital. And so if they both go down at the same time, that's problematic, obviously. Well, and, and so this negative correlation that you're describing, the positive correlation between yield and equity price right. or negative between the bond price and, and equity price, what you're saying is, is, is that they dampen each other, basically, right? Presently, so, yeah. So the current construction is, a portfolio that is constructed of 50-50 bonds. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. And, and equity price. What you're saying is, is, is that they dampen each other basically, right? Presently, so, yeah. So the current construction is a portfolio that is constructed of 50-50 bonds or equities might actually have far less risk than I'm targeting, right? But the risk that is uh, realized in the portfolio in terms of the volatility of the portfolio as we measure it 
that's going to be much lower than the historical levels because of this inverse relationship. Certainly. I mean, if you look back historically, like really far back, I mean, before 08, the correlation was kind of zero. And so, once again, it's, it tends to be leverage that tends to uh, you know, be the great undoing. Well, the leverage is what magnifies it, right? So, given this observed correlation, we double our positions. We own 100% equities, 100% bonds for a 200% levered portfolio. And if that correlation disappears, then that portfolio becomes wildly more volatile than we're expecting. Exactly. Well, I mean, in theory, I mean, if you have leverage, you could lose all your money or more. Yep. Whereas if you're not unlevered, I mean, you lose everything, but that's still, you know, kind of reasonable. You're not going to debt. Do you think this contributed, this phenomenon contributed to the fourth quarter of last year? Do you think this played a role? Uh, it worked out very helpfully because bonds rallied and stocks went down. So people who were in a, in a levered mixed portfolio, I mean, they didn't like it, but they did okay. I mean, the, the hedge worked very well. I think that's actually one of the important things about the fourth quarter is, is that because that hedge worked so well, there was actually significantly greater buying power than people might have otherwise anticipated. The pensions were the huge players in this, but they needed to rebalance out of equity or out of bond positions that had appreciated significantly, and that created a significant amount of buying power for the equities. Well, that, but also, I mean, there's buying and selling going on. You have to, have to sell both. If, if, they, if you had a, a different correlation if both assets went down, then there'd be no buying at all. Everyone would be selling everything. That's, I think that's the key thing there. Well, and, and that underlying dynamic, I think you're right, has underpinned kind of the growth of risk parity, the growth of these levered portfolios. And when you do that, you expand the overall demand for financial assets in total, right? And the only solution to that is either you issue more or they go up in price. Right, that's the only way you accommodate it. Seemingly. What could cause that to unwind? I mean, you highlight higher interest rates. That seems like a, a call that people have been making for a very long time. I mean, I'm not predicting higher rates. My prediction, you know, for the record, has been, you know, tens will be below 3.5% till 2023 or maybe a little beyond there, uh, which I think we're going to talk about probably pretty soon. But, you know, if you got rates up there, that usually would, would be because you have inflation, which, once again, I'm not predicting to happen anytime soon. And it's the, it seems to be inflation that seems to link up pretty well with the correlation. So when you talk about 2023, let's, let's sit on that for a second. Why particular 2023? What do you see happening in 2023? The grand scheme of the world is um, number of people, population, uh, labor force, times hours worked, times productivity. And uh, what you've seen happening over the last, I don't know, 10 years is a declining growth rate in the labor force driven by demographics. Uh, the boomers are slowly retiring, and the millennials have, are they're still in college, they haven't quite come into labor force. What you're going to see happening starting in 23 to 27 is a flattening and then a reversal of the labor force growth rate, and it will start to, uh, start to rise significantly in probably 26 to 28, and that will help the economy, uh, and that will also probably where, where you see uh, inflation come in, as well as seeing uh, rates going higher. So when you, when you highlight that, I mean, what we're really seeing there is primarily the last of the boomers leaving, right, more than the, the millennials coming in, because the millennials are largely in, right? What you're describing is the retirement of the boomers, effectively. No, it's both. I mean, the millennials, are, are, they're coming in, but they have to go and form families. Mm -hmm. um, millennials form families probably six years later than uh, the previous generation. Uh, and um, you go look at New York or San Fran, first child comes in age, what, 31, 32? So uh, you know, you've had delayed marriage, delayed families. Once you get married, have a hustle formation. You buy more cars, you buy more house, you buy dishwashers and beds and, and everything else. And there, there's a demand for, for products there. Now, this is very similar to the, uh, to the 70s. The inflation then was driven by this giant baby boom generation, the pig and the python, moving on through. Well, and, you know, the key difference, I would argue, between now and the 1970s is that the millennials are nowhere near as large relative to the group that preceded them as the boomers were, right? So the boomers were explosively larger than the two generations that came before them. And it was compounded by immigration and everything else, right? So yeah, Certainly. I mean, but, I mean, it, you'll have an increase. It just won't be as great. You won't get 14% right. long bonds. Okay. But I mean, we're at two and a half now, so could they go to, you know, four or five? Yeah, probably. There is room between those two. A little bit. All right. So given that type of forecast that you kind of think, we're three to five years away from the idea that interest rates could begin to rise significantly. What else does that, what, what other trades, you know, are created if you're kind of able to take a sidestep and say, I don't need to decide what's going to happen over the next 
12 months or even three months or one month as, as many managers are evaluated. How do you think about trades that might work over a longer time period? I think you have to go look for trades where there's um, where regulation or politics uh, forces things to be out of line. I think straight up, you know, uh, six month, you know, investing liquid assets is going to be very challenging. I think that that's why you've seen uh, hedge funds have so underperformed. I think people who are f focused on sharp ratios are going to underperform uh, for the same reason. Uh, you have to go longer term to go to go find some of those things, and they're going to be volatile. I think in the next you know few years. Uh, the guys who are long vol will probably be disappointed because I don't think the curve is going to steepen until a year, year and a half from now. I mean, I am a believer that the curve is predictive. Uh, I, I'm definitely uh, in the camp that it's never different this time. Uh, the curve first inverted last December, 18 months ahead is June of next year. Okay, fine. We get a recession or something happens then. That's kind of my target. So uh, I've been advocating buying yield curve options. They're a little richer now than when I first advertised them, but it's still uh, still a good idea. Balls are still very low. And when you talk about buying yield curve options, I just want to be clear. You're, you're talking about buying bets on, say, a 10s to steepener, right? So the difference between a 10-year and a 2-year or a 10-year and a 3-month or anything in a, in a forward component. It, it, it's unfortunate, but these trades are only available professionally uh, because you, you, you can't buy a call on the on, on, on the. On the the two-year or to put it on the 10-year, uh, it, does, it doesn't work. You want to isolate that curve, whether it's up or down, and you can only get that kind of uh, vector risk. With well, and, and so when you're saying up or down, what you're referring to is whether yields are higher or lower. You just want to capture the difference between the two. I'd be betting that it, it could be the two-year rate lower or the 10-year rate higher, yep. right? and I'm not sure which one's going to be. All right. What's your bias? <sighs> Probably two's lower. Yeah, that's mine too. In the near term, because I've already said tens can't go above three and a half till five years from now, so I'm kind of boxed into twos down. Right. One of the ways to express if you if you're biased towards twos lower, one of the ways it would be just to buy a shorter duration bonds. I mean, like you would generally view twos as a reasonable trade at this point. That's similar to expressing some of the. Well, you're locking in your you're locking in your rate for the next uh, next two years. That's good, yeah. but I mean, if you're actually right and rates go down, you're not going to make any money because there's no duration to them. Yeah. So I mean, as as as, as a so as, as an asset to own to fund other activities, twos are fine. And this is one of the things that is really hard, I think, for people to to typically grasp is this dynamic of how curve structure actually matters in terms of the return profile, right? So. One of the things I sent you before we went into into this, and I don't think you actually had a chance to review it, is actually the Fed coming out and talking, uh, revealing in their minutes that the staff has presented their ideas about how to handle uh, any forward QE or any behavior in terms of the need to buy bonds in the future. And one of the things that they brought up was this idea that they want to skew towards the front of the the front of the curve to reestablish term premium, meaning. Tens go up relative to two, so that would work brilliantly in your trade. But what do you think about the implications of something like that? From a public policy standpoint, I think it's a fine idea. I think that governments releasing the back end of the curve so there's information available in the market is important for people. P people should know how we view we being the market, we being you know citizenry risk in the future, and that way we could properly go and allocate risk. You know, when the Fed went and did a the slow rise of rates in 04 to 06, I think that was a, a huge contributor to the problem because if you're raising rates by a quarter point every meeting, you get moral hazard. I think by releasing the back end, and, and it's unclear to me that the back end's gonna go up a lot if they buy the front end. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but at least we'll know that it's, it's, it's the market signaling. And I think having that signaling is important. One of the risks in that that I would see is, is that if you saw that type of behavior, it would result in an extraneous shift in the back end of the curve that might have nothing to do with underlying risk exposures. And so that correlation that you were highlighting strikes me that the risk would be that that would break. Unclear to me that you're going to see back end rates go up, even if the Fed uh, works on the front end only. I mean, you have this baby boom demographic that needs to go and sell equity and buy debt. And that's what they've been doing for the last 10 years. I think the net buyer, retail buyer of equities is like zero for the last 10 years, and it's been all all the back end, and theoretically, you're supposed to own your age in in bonds, and the average boomer is what I don't know, 62 right now, 63. Um, they need to keep selling equity and buying debt, and they may be able to absorb all the available supply that's out there. 
Yeah, that's going to be the real question is when do they begin to significantly start selling their equity? Because I think you're right. I think the number is only very modestly negative at this point. But it, last year, we started to see it pick up fairly significantly. I think you and I and Chris Cole all agreed yeah. that basically the net buyer of equity has been uh, corporations. That's, that's kind of it. So talk about that for a second. How do you think about the implications of corporate share buybacks as it relates to risk as you see it. And in particular, you highlighted to me one of one of the areas in triple Bs where there's been an extraordinary increase in the quantity of bonds, investment grade bonds that are rated triple B. Has that been driven by the financial engineering dynamic of corporate share buybacks? And what risks does that create? Because that seems like one of the areas you've been very focused on. Management 101 is just put the care we want people to go. And, and, and people tend to, to follow the carrot as, uh, as directed. Uh, the Fed wanted inflation. That was the idea. They, they infl- uh, this is we're talking 10 years ago. They wanted inflation because inflation is the way you basically get rid of debt, the, uh, one way or the other. They got inflation. Unfortunately, it wasn't in wages. It was in assets. Um, they took rates down, and people started buying equities or other high-yield instruments to go in and get, get a return because they'd removed any return in your basic safe assets, treasuries, uh, swaps, futures, uh, Fannie Frage, any mortgages. And corporations have basically followed the line. If they can go and issue debt at very low rates, maybe even below their dividend yield, um, they're supposed to go and issue that and, and buy back their stock. So they're acting rationally. The downside, of course, is that when you buy back the stock, you reduce the cushion available for a corporation uh, to survive you know, the flood when it comes. And I'm not saying a flood's coming, but it will. And, and, and if you remove the cushion, uh, you're troubled. I mean, if you look back to Wall Street firms, you know, in, you know, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, they were buying back their own equity at 1.5, 2x. I mean, who, 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 who buys back, a financial buying back their stock at two times book is almost insanity. Yet, it will do the one good thing, which is increase their ROE. And if people are paid based on ROE, then, well, they'll do it. So, I mean, everybody acts rationally from their own point of view. And it's management's job, the Fed's job, government's job to go and create the carrots so people act uh, in the way that's best public policy. Uh, so you can lay a good portion of, of this problem uh, at the Fed. It wasn't a bad deed. They weren't in trying to cause trouble. But um, the, the idea was sound, creating inflation. The implementation wasn't crazy. It just didn't work out that way. The, the, uh, so we've had inflation. It's all been in assets. Um, and of course, you know, who owns assets, thus you get wealth inequality uh, increasing. So, I mean, it, it's, it's all very logical. Uh, so, unfortunately, it's not good. So, what are the implications of that inequality in your mind, right? And that, that increase in inequality? Again, not suggesting that there's a major flood ahead, but we have inflation in assets. That has the irony of making them unaffordable for many of the millennials that would like to buy them, right? Or they get to buy far less than they otherwise would want to. How do you think about the implications of that going forward? Uh, you're dipping into politics now, which I'm not sure we're supposed to go into. Um, well, you are. You're supposed to. <laughs> Clearly, inequality is problematic for lots of reasons. Um, and uh, I think the bigger question, I think we could all agree that, that that's not good. Uh, the question is, how do you go and, 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 and reverse it? Lots of ways to go and do that. I don't think there's one great way of doing it. I suppose that creating opportunity for, you know, for people to move around in the uh, you know, economic sphere is probably the best way to go and do it. Uh, but you know, I'm not going to propose one way over the other. And that's a very hard and slow-moving frame, right? And I do want to actually make sure that, that people well, understand. Well, it sounds like you're trying to lead me into MMT, which I, which I kind of don't want to go into. Yeah, um, that's where I was going. Yeah, OK. Darn but it, Now you got to go there. Well, MMT, I mean, look, MMT is, is it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen in 2020 if you're a Democrat. It'll happen in 2029. If it's not Democrat, because by that stage, you're going to have some real demographic issues. I, how do you go pay for Social Security and Medicare, which is the dominant government transfer function right now? Uh, so we're going to get it. And they're not wrong in the sense that, uh, that a guy that prints, a government that prints their own money and borrows their own money, can they borrow as much as they want? Yes, they can. You cannot go bankrupt if you borrow in your own currency and you print it. The fact that we're a reserve currency, all the better. Um, and, and the theory simply because that means other people have to buy it as well. Well, no, you you will get paid back in the, the the currency, and we could print it. Now the question is, how many loaves of bread can you buy with the currency? That's a different story entirely. We're not talking about value; we're talking about nominal 
debt. So MMT works in that sense. The problem is, is that as proposed by you know, the experts is you could do MMT until you've absorbed capacity and the signal for that is inflation. I kind of doubt that when we get the inflation that the politicians will be, and, and the bell's ringing, that they'll stop the MMT. Um, I haven't seen it happen yet. Um, and, and I doubt it's going to go and change. Taking away goodies from people does not get you reelected. And politicians, their goal is to get reelected. That's their carrot. Um, uh, Japan, the, the notion that, you, that a government can't create inflation is also false, Japan notwithstanding. It's just a matter of how hard you try. I mean, Japan really started trying, you know, five years ago, and, you know, the currency depreciated by, what, 50% in a year and a half? So clearly, it works. It's a matter of how hard you want to try. Um, creating 3 or 4% inflation is really tough. Creating 10% is easy. I mean, everyone can do that. You end up with, you know, Zimbabwe style. Uh, creating 3 or 4 is a little more challenging to do because you got to kind of thread the needle on that. Um, and this, is, uh, this is the likely problem with MMT is, is, is that uh, they're not going to be able to go get to the two or three inflation and then stop. Um, so, uh, but it, it, it's going to happen. So I, I, I tend to agree with that. I think, unfortunately, that we've opened the genie or the bottle and the genie is on its way out. Um, it's and not the, by the way, the, the denouement might well be 30 years from now, yeah. so I won't be able to find out about it. Um, sure you will. You're going to last that long. <laughs> um, when you think about that type of dynamic, and, and, and again, you said you may not be here, does that type of long-term philosophy factor into how you think about investing today? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, what is one's investment horizon? People, people are always saying, this is the worst. Uh, um, right now, this is the worst political environment ever. That's preposterous. I mean, 1968, they were shooting college kids on the street, for God's sakes, okay? They, they, we had multiple assassinations. We don't have that right now. I mean, you may just like certain politicians here, but no one's getting shot yet. So things could be an awful lot worse. Um, people just have a very, how long is someone's investment horizon? I mean, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe if you start young, whereas the actual cycle of demographics and, and, and uh, politics is much longer than that. So it's, it's unfair to go and say that this is the worst ever. Now, can you say it's the worst in my lifetime? You could say that, um, but, uh, it's never different this time. Humanity hasn't changed all that much. We still read the Greek classics because uh, they identified hubris as the destroyer of mankind, and so greed and ego still are the key drivers. Putting a price on greed and ego is a tad more challenging, but um, it's, it's, it's still there. I love that visual, by the way, putting a price on greed and ego. Wh <laughs> where do you think we are in the cycle? Are we in greed or are we um, in despair? Because when I talk to people in our industry, the perception is it's despair. That this is this is terrible. This is the worst it's ever been. Nobody can make any money. As noted, this is not the worst it's ever been. Okay. Um, I think the despair, if I had to go and identify it, ain't with guys like you and me at this conference. Um, the despair right now is the, let's call it the 50, 55-year-old, 60-year-old boomer who did not save enough money along the way, who recognized that Social Security is not going to go and provide an income that you could live on. Uh, I mean... It, 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 it's, it's money, it's income, but not enough, to, not enough to maintain their current lifestyle. And they don't have the savings to go and augment that. And they're probably extraordinarily worried. And if you want to go and look at what's happening in our politics today, I would say that the president is not the problem, he's a symptom. Now, how do you resolve that problem? Unclear, because people did not have the personal responsibility or wherewithal or desire, whatever it might be, to go and save enough to work. If, if you took Social Security and adjusted it to 1936 levels of retirement, I think the age is what, like 84? I um, mean, no one lived to be 65 in 1936. Mm -hmm. um, so now you have people who are retiring at age 65 who got another 20, 25 years, and the system was not built for that. And they recognize it, they're not stupid, and they are very worried. And I think that's where the, where the concern is in the economy, if there's going to be any kind of despair. I think that's actually a really interesting point, that functionally the comp the composition of the economy will influence the levels of confidence and the perception of of uh, the status, right? I agree with you that the boomers are far less hopeful today than they were in 1999 when it seemed everything could go right. Well, they're also younger. They're much further away from that retirement date. Yes, 100%. That's, uh, that's largely what I meant. When we think about how to actually put something like that into... Uh, into meaning though, right? What are they doing that we can then take advantage of? 
right? What, what, is, what is this desperate and fearful boomer who is now trying to save? How are they saving? What are they doing that is, they're being forced into this behavior? How do you take advantage of that? I'm not asking you to take advantage of individuals, obviously. I, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I mean, taking advantage of it, I think that's why you're going to have low rates. You're, mm -hmm. you're just not going to see desperately higher rates in the next, you know, five years. I mean, what I've been doing is I own, um, and this is this is a, this is thing where where the listeners here can can be involved. I buy closed end funds, I buy REITs, uh, mortgage levered REITs, um, I buy MLPs, things where the front end rate is interesting because if you look at how a, a, a levered muni REIT, uh, muni closed end fund uh, for tax advantages, terrific. Because what are they doing? They're they're, they're buying if hundred dollars of assets. They buy 130 bucks of, of, uh, of bonds, they borrow 30. To, uh, the reason why you're seeing this big disconnect of where these uh, closed up funds traded at discount is because they're pricing in the fact that the borrowing costs are going up and therefore the coupon's gonna go down on that spread. To the extent that the front end rate comes back down again via the Fed, that coupon, the dividend, will go back up and these assets will, will, will perform quite well. So that's a way of betting on the front end and the fact that they carry now at, you know, muni stuff at what, four and a half um, MLPs at maybe nine, some of the REITs at 10, 11. Um, they're volatile. They are volatile. Um, and uh, as, as a sharp investment, they probably suck. But as a, I'm going to own it now and, you know, I'm going to have it in five years, I, I, I kind of think I win. So you just referenced sharp, and just to be clear, we're referring to sharp ratio on the asset, which is typically how institutional investors are evaluated. Why is why would you invest in something that has a terrible sharp ratio? I think sharp is meaningless. Uh, if you go to my website and look at my latest write up, it really is a deconstruction of sharp. I think the focus on sharp, I think it's a marketing tool, but I think it's almost irrelevant because most of the of the high sharp investments have very low yields. They're very stable investments. Uh, and to make any kind of, to make an income. So if you're a government pension and your bogey is what, seven, seven and a half, um, you may have a two, two and a half percent yielding investment unlevered with a high sharp to go and get it to be viable. You're going to have to lever it three to one and you'll then hit your seven percent bogey. The problem is you lever it three to one and if bad things happen, um, you really get hurt. Uh, an example would be um, 10 years ago, if you looked at um, AAA subprime uh, bonds. They were yielding you know, LIBOR plus 50, plus 60, very popular at the time, and they had almost no volatility. They had a sharp ratio of, I think, under 12 or something like that, 7, 8, 10, 12. They were actually two or three times as volatile as three-month T-bills. So if you're a sharp ratio guy, you're going to buy those. They had a great sharp until they didn't and were down, you know, 80 points. I think of focusing on sharp is um, misdirects you. And just to be clear, when you say 80 points, they were down 80 points relative to 100 par. So down yes. 80%. Yes. yes. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, Neil Chris, uh, uh, who used to run Hutch and Hill and is another person I'd love to have on at some point, has a great expression, which is a high sharp ratio asset is simply an asset that we don't have their left tail event in the database yet. 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 Uh, okay. Yet. And that's, that's the well, critical thing. you really look component. at sharp, but you really, I think it's almost a misnomer. What you're really talking about is, liquid versus illiquid assets. You should look at something and say, what will this asset return two years, five years from now? What's my reasonable expectation? What's my possible drawdown gonna be if I'm wrong? And, and, and then size accordingly. I'm a believer that sizing is more important than entry level. I will never buy the bottom or sell the top if only by blind luck it happens. I size it big enough so I can make a meaningful return and small enough so if I'm wrong, it doesn't hurt me and then you diversify from there. There's plenty of instruments out there that have lousy sharps because they have multiple risk components with big bid offers. So all you're really describing is something that closes on the bid and the offer back and forth. That's, that's not a bad asset, it's just less liquid, and therefore you size it accordingly. Uh, you will not be able to get out of that asset quickly, but once again, you size accordingly. And I think if you diversify amongst them, you're probably fine. Um, I know that, that, that my portfolio of uh, closed-end funds has basically beaten the spoos in the last uh, number of years. Just because if I'm clipping a 9%, 10% coupon uh, every year and then reinvest it, I'm probably going to be okay. Will it, did it draw down in December? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 what I thought was a 50 beta 
portfolio was more like 120 beta portfolio. So I didn't like that. But once again, there was nothing that fundamentally altered these investments. They were just less liquid and they kind of moved. So you size them accordingly and you're fine. So when I think about this issue of sizing, or I think about this issue of an unforeseen change in beta, right? And really what you're talking about when that occurs is you move to some level at which there's an attachment point, right? It's like an option that goes in the money, right? The beta is unstable. Do you feel that those risks are adequately understood today? Do you think that people are thinking in those terms about position sizing being more important than the required return? Uh, I think that um, one thing they fail to teach in, uh, in graduate school is common sense, which I guess you could only get through years of experience, not through a class. I rarely buy single name stocks. And the reason why is there's no accounting for the lightning bolt. So if you looked, you know, was it 10 years ago, whatever it was, at the majors, uh, major oil companies, so Exxon, Chevron, uh, Total, BP, the whole, the whole lot of them, they all have the same PE, they all have the same dividend, they all have the same portfolio, basically what they were doing. And BP goes and drills a hole in the Gulf of Mexico. Like, where'd that come from? You can't predict that. There's, there's, there's no uh, parsing through the financials that's gonna go tell you that. Uh, and so therefore, you kind of have to go and size accordingly for these things. You can always have these unknown events that happen. And, there, and, and so therefore, A, you diversify, and B, you size accordingly because you just can't predict these things. And, and to go and say, an attachment point implies you could guess where they're going to occur. Well, but, but you can't. As much as I hate to go and quote Donald Rumsfeld, I mean, you know, you got to know what you don't know. Known unknowns. Um, that's a, an, an interesting one, right? Because you mentioned BP drilled a hole, right? What you actually meant is BP improperly plugged a hole, right? So stuff started leaking out. But when you think about those sorts of risks and this idea that you don't want to be an investor in a single stock, like that feels very much like where the market is going, right? That's just by the index. Yes. Is there a point at which that ceases to be a good idea? We're probably getting there. There's going to come a point when you have more passive investing than active investing, and that will be problematic. I know you've spoken about this a great deal. We tend to agree on that topic that you're going to go and create uh, an embedded short convexity. And I wrote about this a, a couple of years ago. At some point, someone's got to go and put a price, put a value on something. You have to go and discount what a company's worth and what the odds of them making money are in the future are going to be. So that that will be important. Uh, when we get there, I don't know. I, I think that there's room for professionals to go and do that job. For the average retail public, I find it challenging to go and uh, have them pick names. If, if I give advice to people, they always want to go and invest in some, yeah, the next big thing. And I hate to break their hearts and say, 60-40, man, just buy Vanguard this and buy some other, you know, five-year IG fund and call it a day. Because by the time you've heard a great idea, it's it's already over. I certainly will vouch for that. And that's actually, I mean, one of the interesting phenomenons I think that's occurred is people have gone, have, have basically taken that message, right? And said, I, I have no insight. And I think the dot-com experience was really instrumental in that. People basically bought into the new, new thing, it turned out horribly disappointing for the most part. Several of the champions that were very highly valued in that time period have validated all of their expectations, but many others didn't, right? And so, you know, the BP example is a great one. If you picked Microsoft, absolutely fantastic. If you picked JDS Uniphase, it didn't, think, so it didn't work out so well for you, right? And so it feels like people have gone in the opposite, have gone full bore to your view, which is, you know what, I'm just going to step out and I'm just going to do a 60-40 portfolio where I own some fraction of bonds and I own some fraction of equities. And in fact, it feels like that's the dominant feature, right? I mean, people talk about euphoria or the lack thereof. I think what they're really saying is nobody cares about the individual companies anymore. There's some millennial fascination with Tesla and others, but. Well, to the extent that the government, you know, acts in a, in a, in a, in a clever way and puts out clever policies, tax policies that incent people to act, you know, in, in a, good, a way that's good for public policy, you will get growth in the economy, growth greater than population, so net real growth. And to the extent the, the, the S&P captures that, then that's okay. I, I just, I mean, you can be very smart and you can pick things out. Um, I have a very hard time identifying um, good ideas ex ante because great ideas always seem so pedestrian at the time. I think like the post-it note, like that's a great idea. Yeah, clearly it was, but but no one had thought of it until it happened. 
Starbucks, great investment. Uh, I remember everyone running up to say the, the Krispy Kreme is the next great big investment, that's next Starbucks. I, I, I'm pretty good at drinking coffee. I could probably take down five cups a day, uh, like a good type A. I'm not sure I can have a donut five times a day. Um, that's a little more challenging. Well, I certainly can do that, but <laughs> that also explains our relative fitness levels. What sort of other opportunities do you think have been created by the central bank behavior? All right, so one of the trades that, that you and I have talked about in the past, um, one of the ones that I like quite a bit, actually, are some of the, the FX dynamics, where we have extraordinarily low volatility in currencies, um, even as everybody's engaged in one form or another in some idea that we're going to use our currency in, a, in either a trade war or in a beggar thy neighbor policy, because everybody's searching for this growth. I think you got to think about the secondary and tertiary impacts. So... In the U.S., we've taken rates down, but let's look at like Europe, where they have negative rates. Um, they have negative rates there to encourage investment and growth, and, and hopefully that works. And it, it might. But the other effect is other financial instruments and the forward price that gets spit out of it. A forward price is not the market's prediction of something. It's the mathematical present value of the two instruments and where they are in the future. And then some arbitrageur comes in and they keep it there and market makers' jobs are to keep those things in line. Uh, so if you go look at um, uh, SX5E, a five-year forward price might be down 20% from the current price. And so just to be really clear, the SX5E is the Euro stocks composite of... It's like the Dow 30, it's exactly. the Dow 50 in Europe. Correct, okay. When you get, and, and so it's not a prediction that that index will be down 20% in a few years, it's just when you have a 4% dividend and a negative funding rate, well, you get that price to go down and you can then buy that in the future. Um, that creates very interesting asset allocation, beta replacement strategies. So you can go and buy an at the money call, you could sell like a 20% out of the money put and buy that, own that instead of uh, owning the actual asset itself, uh, which is very clever. And that, that, that wasn't the ECB's design. It wasn't to go and create that trade it's a byproduct of their primary goal of reinvigorating the economy. And so I like to look for trades where you get, I guess I'll call it the wrong price for want of a better word, but a price that exists because of something else. Well, when you describe it, and you, I think you nailed it perfectly, right? It, it is forward prices are a non-arbitrage condition, yep. right? It is not an attempt at a prediction. It's simply saying we have one yield at this level and another yield at this level. And if I want to create an exchange between the two at some point in the future, those have to deliver equivalent dynamics. Does that feel fair? Okay. So I'm going to give you a credibility shout out here because you were one of the few people um, who seven years ago was looking at this with the S&P 500 where the interest rates were extraordinarily low at that time period, and because valuations were much lower, dividend yields were in excess of uh, risk-free rates, right? And so we had a <laughs> dynamic in place where the forward price for the S&P was give or take 20% below the spot price, five years out, 10 years out, correct? You, 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 had, you had multiple things uh, working with that with that ticket. Uh, one was the forward price. The other was the uh, skew in long dated options. Mm -hmm. um, if you look in short dated vol, uh, one, two, three, six months, one year out, should an out of the money put have a higher implied volatility than an out of the money call? Yeah, it should. Prices go down faster than they go up. There's a demand for hedging from various people, and there's a demand for current income uh, from other investors. So the guys who want current, the guys who want to convert, Potential capital gains into current income will do a covered call strategy. People who want to hedge out short-term risk, um, they'll buy an out-of-the-money put. So that will create a huge skew. Should you get that same sort of skew in an ultra-long-dated option, five-year or 10 years? Well, the answer is no. Uh, as a matter of fact, one could argue that the skew for a 10-year option should be reversed. Because if you buy uh, 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 an equity, the most you could lose is what you paid for it. Whereas if you short it, like if you short Amazon, um, you, you could lose an awful lot of money there. Uh, you have infinite loss being short in equity. So if you think of things in terms of potential risk, 
being short tenure call is much more problematic than being short tenure put. Uh, so at the time we had a big skew in puts versus calls going out 10 years, and you could put together a rather, a rather fancy trade where you could um, uh, buy the call, sell the put uh, for zero cost and have incredible exposure. So the, the exact ticket that we, we looked at back then was um, uh, buying the 1800 call and selling the 850 put on the S&P. Market then was about 14, 1450 uh, for 10 years, zero cost. Um, and that's clearly, that worked. That trade worked out very well. well. You actually went even a step further and you um, created a structured product that basically had no takers, except for you and a few people. Yes that used that opportunity and effectively delivered like 14% returns, 12.5% returns, if I remember correctly? So the idea, I wrote, this is on my website, you can go find it. Um, it's called a delicious gift from the Fed or a delicious gift from QE, something like that. We basically took the investor, bought a, it's a retail product, bought a structured note from uh, Bank America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, you invest $100. If it goes down, if, uh, it's a 10-year trade. If 10 years from now, s and is down by 10%, you get back 90 bucks, down 10%, one for one trade, down 20 points, you get back 80 bucks. So you participate one for one on the downside. On the upside, it pays off nine to one. So if it goes up 10%, you get back you know, 190. It was capped at 220%. So theoretically, you invest $100, you get back $320 10 years hence, um, which would be a 12.5% compounded return for a decade. At the time, S&P was 11.25, hit the max cap was 14.25. Um, you'd get your 320 points back. 12.5% compounded for 10 years. From that point, would have been 3,600 on SPOOs, and right now we're, what, 28, 29? Mm -hmm. So um, I couldn't give it away. Five of us bought the trade, and that was it. I went to 40 MDs in the firm, all in trading. They wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't they do it? Well, this is why I hate sharp ratios. It was too illiquid and too volatile and too this, too that. It's like, you're buying a 10-year option, man. A 10-year investment, you're always going to have some amount of money in equities. So whatever it is, make this 10%, 15% of that, because you're always going to have some exposure. Uh, no takers. Well, five takers. <laughs> and what would happen today if you were to look at a product like that? It will not produce a return as nicely for various reasons. You have tighter credit spreads, you have a flatter skew, you have different interest rate differentials. Um, but there are other trades out there that I won't say are as easy as that one, but are, are, are similar in construct where things are just out of line. A, a trade I like right now, which I will tell you that it, it's, it's gonna hurt. Uh, I have it on, it's um, looking at uh, the Turkish Lira versus the euro. So they've taken the Turkish rate up to, uh, I think, 21, 24% to go fight inflation and other problems with the currency. And the euro, of course, is, is negative. So you get a, a massively discounted forward rate. Um, inflation, I believe, is running at 12, 12 and a half, 13, 14, 15. So a 24% rate, certainly, you know, the, cur the, the forward should not, we shouldn't realize the forward, we should get better than that. In theory, I guess you could say that Turkey could be problematic. It could be in Argentina, it could be in Venezuela. I don't think so. I don't think so because I think Erdogan, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a tough guy, um, but he has bigger goals. Uh, his goal is to, you know, have return Turkey to, um, you know. The Ottoman Empire, basically. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to say start the caliphate again, yeah. but rephrase. He would like to be a modern-day Nasser, what Egypt was, you know, 60 years ago. To do that, you need a real economy, you need a real currency, you need real laws. Um, and, and, and if he did not, if he was willing to go and take a 24%, you know, government rate right now, he doesn't have to. He can go and, and say you can't do that. He could do worse than that, I guess, if he wanted to, to the central bank, and he doesn't. The fact that he tolerates a 24% rate that throws the country into a recession tells you that what he wants to do. And I'm willing to bet on his ego of wanting to go and be the leader of the Muslim world, which I have no problem with uh, politically. Um, this is an economic idea. I think he wants to go and do that. And therefore, the currency, although it's troubled right now, um, is not going to realize forwards at all. And so the trade I've put on is a butterfly trade where I buy, I actually buy an option that's in the money already versus, versus the spot. Mm -hmm. And then I sell 
a, a, a middle option and then buy a tail. So it, it's on my, on my website. Uh, the trade I did at the time is when the spot was uh, 606, mm -hmm. that's Euro Turkey, I bought the 7.18, so basically 15, 17 points percent in the money, bought that, sold the nine strike, bought the 11 strike, just in case I'm wrong, I want that 9.11, that's, that's max loss. I did the trade for zero cost, and if this trade ends up at 7.18 or below, I win. If it's you know below nine, I get zero. If it's above nine, I got a problem. Do I think it'll get there? Clearly not. The fact that the Turks right now are interested in buying Russian air defense missiles is a small problem, and so it's marked market against me. Once again, I sized it accordingly. Um, at max loss, I'll be fine. I'm not gonna like it, but I'll be fine. And if I'm right, uh, I'll get a pretty fancy return. So, but this is again, very similar in structure. You're looking out longer dated. You're recognizing, uh, what's the tenor? I went out to, I, I did a 20 month option. 20 month, okay. So I, I went to October, so before the US election. I, I didn't want that involved That is in that. a risk factor, okay. Yeah. And so you're basically capturing one and a half years at 24% interest rate, right? And then there's a volatility component that you're offsetting by selling, you know, selling the near the money uh, That's exactly right. I'm, 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 I'm taking basically, I got my, at the time it was 21%, so I'm 21 on one side, on the asset side, negative 0.6, the euro on the other, times 20 months. I'm basically locking in kind of that return. Mm -hmm. The important thing here is, I guess the other way you could do is to buy 20-month Turkish bonds. I don't want that because the problem I have is what if the currency devalues? I paid par for it at 606. It's now 7 so it's still a profit for me in my option trade, but you're now gonna go get your principal back down 15% and you're a loser. I did not want that tail end principal in the trade. I wanted it all via options, so I'm protected. That is a very, you know. Um, it's a high end trade. It's, it, it, <laughs> it is a very challenging trade for people to, to um, implement on a personal basis, but the general idea remains the same as what you've talked about before, right? Which is this idea that significant differentials that are created for reasons that may be positive. For example, um, Erdogan hiking interest rates or allowing interest rates to be hiked to defend the currency paradoxically creates conditions that you can execute a very levered and, pro and potentially very profitable trade in the currency. If right. you want to look at the trade that real people can do, um, I would not say do it now. I do not have it on myself. I've had it on before, um, is uh, listed uh, futures on European dividends. They actually trade. You, they have listed futures in Europe, in Japan, and in the US on SPUs, on the UK, and the SX5E. Uh, in the US, going back over the last 80 years, divs go up about 2.5% a year. And if you look at the dividends futures strip, it's up about 2.5% a year in the US. Japan, they go up about 1% a year, and that curve's kind of flat, maybe up slightly. In Europe, it's massively negative despite the fact that most Wall Street firms are predicting higher dividends. Why is that? Kind of a Volcker rule carry-on where uh, in, in Europe, you have an older demographic. They want coupon, they want yield. They can't get that in bonds because rates are negative. So what do they do? They go to their friendly Wall Street dealer and they say, I'd like an instrument that will give me a high coupon. Wall Street accommodates them by taking this SX5E, the Dow 50 in Europe, slapping on a bunch of options and creating a structured note that pays out a high coupon, but there's a few short options tossed on in there. Wall Street does this trade, gives it to the retail client, uh, but they can't carry the risk anymore. They gotta hedge it out because they can't carry proper risk on their books. So they go and they have to go sell the, the um, they have to buy the, the forward uh, SX5E future. They have to go pay the interest rate to lock in that. Then they gotta go sell this dividend future to lock that in. When they do that, um, they drive down the three, four, five year dividend future, and there's very few buyers. Why is that? Um, well, they, 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 there's no buyers for it because it's a terrible, sharp instrument. Um, because the Wall Street dealers have volatility and convexity in their books, so as the index goes up and down, Dividend futures go up and down. I, I don't think that the dividends should go up, you know, at 80% of the index. That's kind of ridiculous. Yet there's no one to defend it, um, and therefore it trades a negative, a huge negative slope. I think the, I think it goes five to six points a year 
negative um, term surface, which is just kind of silly uh, for uh, this instrument. So uh, that, that exists because of but it's the same. It's, again, it's the same dynamic you were talking about before, right? There's a regulatory framework that one prevents Wall Street banks from holding the risk, right? Or not necessarily Wall Street. There's a lot of this is originated out of French banks, for example, right? They, they can't hold risk that they otherwise might want to warehouse. And there is also a regulatory dynamic in terms of the central banks have set interest rates below the levels that are required to right. achieve the objectives of the savers, right? So the demand for the structured product exists. And those then refer, in terms of the structured profit products and the payouts, refer to the price of the index. They don't refer to the total return of the index. But there's, there's a third component there, which okay. is the demand side for those futures contracts is very limited mm -hmm. because investment funds who uh, try to market a high sharp ratio will not buy it. They, they could buy it, but they won't because the instrument itself is just too volatile. It's volatile because of illiquidity, not because it's fundamentally or economically a bad investment. And that's what we were talking about before, uh, people who, who are misdirected uh, by illiquidity as opposed to a fundamental problem with an investment. Well, so, so let me just make sure that I understand this correctly or I'm conveying it correctly. If I look at something like the Eurostox five-year forward dividend, current level is somewhere around 120, 125. The five-year forward is going to be somewhere around 95, give or take five or six points a year in forward space. Yes. Right? That means that I get to pay $95 and I get to receive whatever the, I pay 95, I receive whatever the actual level of dividends are going to be for the Eurostox five years from now. It's actually a cash settlement contract, so. Yes, but I am outlaying 95 bucks and I receive functionally back 125 if nothing changes. Correct. If there's any form of growth of dividends, I receive that differential, right? So theoretically, if there were 2% growth or 1% growth of dividends, that number would be in the neighborhood of 130 to 135, right, relative to the current level. And so I would roughly get a 50 plus percent return on that. Is that a fair characterization? Fair of, enough. Uh, okay. So now the problem is 50% over five years sounds great, right? But what you're actually saying is in order to get a return that would ultimately matter, I have to allocate close to 100% of my fund to that type of trade. And the volatility of that instrument is going to be very similar to as if I was 100% long equities, which nobody can do in an institutional sense. Well, I think, I mean, first off, I think it's a safer trade because dividends are going to be less volatile than the index at the end of the day. And number two is you have a running start. You're, you're not buying the index buying at below, spot. Yeah. You're buying it down 25%. Also, I'm not sure why you have to go and allocate um, all your funds for this. And, this and, and you're not actually putting in 95 bucks. You're putting in zero bucks. You That's can go and, yeah. and post collateral of yep. any kind of high quality instrument mm -hmm. against that trade. And they're only going to require maybe 20% uh, funding for that. So, I mean, you can, uh, with very little uh, relative capital can get reasonable exposure and not tie yourself up and have cash to go invest in other things. You could have an anchored debt portfolio and use the collateral value, the borrowing capacity of that as the marginability for this kind of investment to get some equity, get, get what I would call safer equity exposure, which by the way is exactly what I've done. But the real risk that you run in that, at least on a short-term basis, and particularly if you apply leverage, is as you're saying, there's a mark-to-market component yes. associated with that trade, right? So when the euro stocks falls on adverse events in Germany or the UK or China, right, um, or the United States, president sends out a tweet, the impact is, is that futures have to be sold and also dividend swaps have to be sold into an illiquid market. And so despite the fact that the dividends themselves exhibit a fraction of the volatility of the market, the, the end instrument, the dividend swap itself that you hold, is very close. It's like a 0.8 beta. Fundamentally, I don't think a whole lot has changed on a mark-to-market -market basis, yes. And, and you gotta remember, why, there's a couple of reasons why it's going down. Uh, one of the primary ones is dealers having to hedge. Yep. Because they have embedded optionality in the structured note they've given to the retail investor. So as that index goes down, they have to adjust their hedge which means they have to go and sell these dividend futures because their exposure has changed. And so they're forced to go, if they, if they want to remain risk flat, they have to go and sell. Um, and so their forced selling into an illiquid instrument makes it more volatile. And similarly, in a rally, 
you will see these dividend futures rally much more, much more than they should, because divs are not going to go keep up one for one with, with the index. So you, you're, you're, there's an illiquidity premium there. Uh, I would much prefer to sell liquidity on a fundamentally sound asset that actually take real risk. Well, so this is one of the things. accordingly. Is, yeah, so and what you're arguing is, is that this is the type of equity substitute, similar to the structured note that you had created previously, that exists. And I, I look at this the same way. I mean, it's interesting if you look even at the United States, where, again, the dividend forward roughly appreciates at about 2% a year. We're looking at a political environment in which there's actually very real pushback at this stage against stock buybacks. And if that cash return were suddenly to be deployed in the form of dividends as compared to stock buybacks, that would represent a windfall to that type of trade. So I, I actually think it's interesting because I think it, that type of trade is, for somebody who is making a fundamental argument, I think the U.S. economy is going to accelerate. Or I think that um, U.S. corporate profitability is going to rise far more rapidly than people are currently forecasting, or even just in line with kind of the 10% plus forecast that is embedded in forward expectations. I think that U.S. div futures are priced fairly. I wouldn't touch them. Interesting. I do think that you've hit on the exact opposite problem over here. The risk to the European dividends is that they start to act like U.S. companies where they reduce dividends and increase stock buybacks. That would happen if, let's say, that executives there started to get more compensation in options and in equity because they'd want to then go and pursue policies that will increase the value of the stock as opposed to the dividend. That's not going to happen. Uh, the politics in Europe, the more important, the demographic in Europe is they demand older, more conservative population. They want dividends. And um, I think the governments will go and gently pressure that stays that way. But if you want to look for the risk of the trade is if Europe was to go and start to do uh, financial engineering the same way the U.S. has, and that would be, um, that'd be a problem. Interesting. That, that, that would be your lightning bolt, where you basically have a political change in, in, in their system over there, uh, which I can't predict. It's unlikely, but it could happen. Thus, you price, you, you, you size accordingly. Interesting. Well, as always, you've come to us with a bunch of great ideas. Um, your website is? Convexdmaven.com. OK. And um, individuals can go there, and they can download the materials. There's no restrictions or anything else, correct? All free. It's all there. And if you'd like to be added to my list, uh, my email address is there. I will be happy to add you. Uh, I don't publish frequently, maybe you know, five times a year. Uh, but when I do, I have something to say. Well, every time you publish, I will tell you, you bring it in the form of stocking stuffers or anything else. I have found it incredibly valuable and useful. I would encourage people to check it out. Harley, as always, it was great sitting down and talk with you. Thank you very much. Let's do it again soon. Thanks, man. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.